So what I want to do is talk about uh, some work that I did in collaboration with John Pandolfi, Dustin Marshall, and Ann Cohen uh, that we published just a few uh, couple of months ago. So um, most of us are, are who work on coral reefs are concerned about the future of coral reefs. Many of you probably work on coral reefs because you became concerned about their future. And so some, some of the particularly alarming projections about where reefs are headed uh, go back to Ove's classic paper in 1999, where he said, well, look, if temperature pr uh, trends proceed uh, according to uh, IPCC projections, we're likely to see widespread annual mass bleaching by around 2030 or so and the, the loss of acroporids from shallow water habitats. More recently, uh, as people have become interested in ocean acidification, uh, we've seen uh, prominent papers projecting uh, widespread disillusion of reefs by around 2050 uh, or maybe a bit earlier. Um, and so this is just a quote from a review by uh, Charlie Varon and a lot of other uh, um, famous uh, coral reef scientists which essentially draws the logical conclusion from these two things. At today's level uh, of CO2, most reefs worldwide are committed to an irreversible decline. At 450, reefs will be in a rapid and terminal decline worldwide. So uh, projections, of course, are based on models, either conceptual, mathematical, graphical, whatever. And, uh, and all models are idealizations or caricatures of nature. That's, that's what models do. That's kind of their job. Um, despite that, they're, uh, they're fundamental to the scientific process. In fact, modeling is fundamental to human cognition. So as you watch and listen to my talk, your brain is doing all, throwing out all kinds of information. It's uh, uh, interpolating what's in your blind spot and all kinds of other things. So, but of course, because they're idealizations and caricatures, all models are idealizations and caricatures. Critical assessment of our uh, projections of reef futures, other kinds of conclusions we, we derive from models, requires a sort of mindfulness about the assumptions we make in our models, uh, the way that we, f the way that we uh, formulate those assumptions. Formally, it requires attention to calibration, testing, and if necessary, modification of assumptions, and the, the increasingly the rigorous derivation of the implications of those assumptions, often by things like mathematical uh, analysis or computer projections and so forth. So what I want to do in this talk is essentially summarize some of the key points from, from our review, which is essentially a critical assessment of uh, some of the projections of coral reef futures. And one of the things we want to know is what's the range of plausible futures? Where in that range of plausible futures do some of the more concerning projections fall? And, and to what extent can we make a judgment about the relative strength of evidence for some of those uh, alternative projected futures? Uh, and because of time, I'm only going to be able to focus on really two things. So with respect to acidification, I'll talk a bit about the calcification response. Um, and that follows on very much from what uh, Malcolm and Sophie talked about. Also, with respect to temperature, I'll talk mainly about bleaching. And in particular, arguments about the extent to which adaptation or phenotypic plasticity might facilitate uh, reefs uh, coping with climate change. Because that's where much of the debate about, uh, about the likely effects of warming uh, center on. So uh, basically the way that projections, quantitative projections about coral reef futures have proceeded work more or less like this. So you measure how calcification varies with uh, aragonite saturation state. Now a uh, social scientist walking out at morning tea with me said, you know, uh, what's omega? Uh, after all of the talks we had this morning. So basically, uh, if, you, if you're wondering what omega is, the, be the best way to think of it is it's a measure of the relative availability of the building blocks of coral skeletons, so calcium and carbonate. So you calibrate, for example, in field measurements or in mesocosms or in aquaria, how calcification changes with omega. You project changes in calcification rates by looking at projections uh, climate change projections for changes in omega in the ocean, mainly uh, in the open ocean, and then you infer changes in calcification based on those calibrated relationships. Now, there are three sort of important equations which uh, uh, encapsulate certain assumptions about how calcification works that underpin these projections. One of them uh, Malcolm showed earlier, this is an equation from physical chemistry. It says that the inorganic rate of precipitation of aragonite follows this function, whoops, sorry, follows, sorry, this function here, 
And so what the important thing about this is uh, that omega, when that's 1, this is 0. So when omega is 1, there's no inorganic precipitation happening. K and N are parameters that just describe how uh, inorganic formation of aragonite increases as omega goes up. Uh, now, uh, an important assumption in these kinds of projections is that the uh, rate of calcification by organisms is linearly proportional to that. So that means that when this shuts down, this shuts down also. And so that doesn't include uh, the, the projection that Malcolm talked about uh, earlier, but it does include uh, the, the key projections that are in the literature at the moment. Uh, and then finally, reef scale or community scale calcification is that uh, biological calcification minus a dissolution and relevant to some of the, the results that Sophie presented in existing projections, this is typically assumed to be constant. That is, it's typically assumed it doesn't change with acidification. So um, the, the most prominent example of this sort of a projection or one of the two, I, I suppose, is uh, work by Silverman and colleagues. So what they did is they measured uh, reef scale calcification or estimated reef scale calcification uh, at a reef in the Red Sea and they, they estimated that it was, it was in fact approximately linearly proportional to that inorganic rate of precipitation consistent with the idea that when this shuts down uh, there's no biological calcification happening the intercept here is negative which means when inorganic precipitation shuts down the only thing going on is disillusion in the reef and so what they did is they took this calibrated relationship, took some projections about uh, what was going to happen in the ocean, and they projected changes in calcification. So at 450 ppm, there's some substantial uh, reductions in calcification rates. Uh, at 560, then the reductions in calcification rates are even larger. And what's significant about 560 is that by this point, uh, you've reached a level where the uh, calcification estimates that um, Silverman and colleagues calibrated uh, are actually less than the expected dissolution. So at this, this is the title of the paper, I think, was something like reefs may start dissolving by, by about 2050. And that comes from this, uh, this projection here. So, um, so a couple of key assumptions that underpin this model. One is this idea that the calcification of, uh, of biological organisms is proportional to this inorganic rate of formation of aragonite. And so from Malcolm's talk, you would already know that this uh, assumption is, is often not a very good one. And in fact, if we look at uh, experiments on individual corals, we often see things like this. This is work by Ann Cohen. When uh, omega reaches one, that's the point where inorganic precipitation would shut off. Uh, corals are still calcifying. Calcification has dropped off quite substantially, but the, there's still a fair bit of calcification happening until omega actually drops uh, much closer towards zero. Uh, a second issue is the extent to which, of course, the calcification response that's calibrated in that particular system is representative of what we'd be likely to see around the world. I was going to show you a graph uh, from our paper, but it's a bit noisy given the amount of time that I've got. Uh, fortuitously, I got uh, spammed with uh, Katie Schamberger's latest paper uh, on the way over here, and I asked her to give me a color figure of this, which is a really, which is nicely illustrates the point. This shows essentially relationships between calcification and omega uh, for a bunch of different mesocosm and field experiments. These, these red squares here are the Silverman study, and these other ones represent other field and mesocosm studies. And one thing you'll notice is that their, the relationship they observe for their reefs suggests essentially crossing the threshold between calcification and dissolution at a little bit above omega equals 3, whereas some of these others suggest a transition at much lower levels of omega. In other words, suggesting that uh, that transition to net reef dissolution might be expected to happen a fair bit uh, later down the track. Uh, but of course, they all show decreases in calcification with decreasing omega. So what, what's the bottom line of this, at least insofar as I can cover ground in this talk? Well, pro projections of net reef dissolution by around mid-century tend to use a functional relationship between calcification and omega that is steeper than recent data suggests. And uh, Malcolm did a nice job of illustrating uh, why that might be uh, uh, on, a, on sort of physiological grounds. The, uh, secondly, the reef calcification response in the Red Sea may be 
at the high end of sensitivity relative to other reef systems. Um, and finally, there are a few unknowns that are actually important for projecting uh, the likely consequences of ocean acidification. One big one is uh, dissolution, and so uh, Sophie conveniently pointed out that dissolution is also likely to respond to acidification. Uh, we don't have this relationship very well calibrated. Obviously, that's going to affect the carbonate balance on, re balance on reefs. And uh, also, of course, we calibrate these relationships typically using either seasonal fluctuations in the field or using short-term experiments. And, and we are assuming that, that those relationships that we calibrate are representative of what we might see uh, as a consequence of long-term climatic trends. And that's something we don't understand very well. So I'll move from there on to bleaching. So this is a figure from Ove's uh, classic paper in 99. It shows uh, temperature, historical and projected temperature in the northern region of the GBR. This solid line is a bleaching threshold. And so this is essentially the basis for, for uh, Ove's projection that by around 2030, we will we'll be exceeding this bleaching threshold pretty much every year. And so we're likely to have annual bleaching events. Now there are formal, there are mathematical projections of effects of uh, increased bleaching frequency on coral assemblages, uh, but they more or less boil down to the same thing. So as bleaching frequency increases, there's more coral mortality and so forth. So, um, so one of the key assumptions of that model, as Ove pointed out in his paper, is that the effects of local adaptation, uh, if they occur, are likely to be too small given the rate of change to materially affect projections about bleaching intensity. So in other words, I don't think Ove is claiming that evolution doesn't happen, uh, but Ove's making the point, I think, that ex likely rates of adaptation are slow relative to uh, the rate at which environmental change is going to occur. And so one of the things we wanted to do is re-examine this issue about how fast local adaptation might happen in light of what's happened since 1999 in evolutionary biology, because there's been a lot of interest among evolutionary biologists about uh, put the potential for rapid evolution. Now, so... The way, one way that evolutionary biologists measure rates of evolutionary change is uh, by thinking about the distribution of, uh, of some traits, say optimal temperature, bleaching threshold, whatever, in a population. There's some average for that population and some variability, uh, some standard deviation. And so evolutionary biologists often measure rates of evolution in terms of how fast that mean can move in response to environmental change uh, expressed in units of standard deviations per generation. And it turns out that, uh, that certainly in some populations across a, fair, so across a fairly broad range of taxa, there's, uh, there's a fairly consistent relationship between that rate of evolution, the Haldanes, uh, as a function of the number of generations that an experiment runs. And so what you can see is over something on the order of 10 generations, in some cases, rates of evolution are so fast, there's something like half a standard deviation every generation, which would be like five standard deviations in 10 generations. Sometimes they're considerably less, orders of magnitude slower than that. So uh, the next question is, is the raw material for rapid adaptation present in coral assemblages? Uh, there's some evidence to suggest variation in susceptibility to bleaching. This is too... Uh, Acropora hyacinthus colonies right next to each other, so obviously in quite a similar environment. One of them is clearly more susceptible to bleaching than the other one. Even at the within colony level, though, uh, this is, a, I think, a Goniopora colony, and there are, there's variation within the colony in, uh, in bleaching here. Now, some, but not all, of the variation in thermal tolerance is heritable, so there's very little work, but a little bit on heritability of uh, things related to thermal tolerance. So then the next question is, well, would we expect corals to be able to evolve uh, rapidly relative to many or at comparable rates to many of, the, many of the other taxa, animal taxa in the graph I showed you earlier? There are a couple of things that are important to consider. One is the issue of, obviously, we're talking about rates of, rates of change per generation. So what's a generation? In corals, it's not very straightforward. but one important point is that coral colonies grow by clonal propagation. And so uh, mutations that occur during clonal propagation during colony growth can be passed on to sexually produced offspring. So a mutant polyp can pass its mutations on uh, through the sperm and eggs. And so that suggests that some evolutionary change can happen 
at, uh, over time scales, over generation scales that are shorter than the length of life of a coral colony. And the second point is that within clone variation, this is work on in other clonal organisms. I think this is on an alga. Ver genetic variation within clones can be quite large compared to between uh, genetically distinct individuals, and that variation can actually be quite highly heritable. We don't have similar experiments like this. We don't have similar data like this on corals. The second issue is, of course, that corals are a partnership between an animal and a plant, um, that the symbiosis increases the raw material for selection because, of course, you have two partners with genetic variation that selection, that selection can act upon. Um, and a second point, this is kind of interesting, people have actually looked at the evolutionary rates of endosymbionts and compared them to free living relatives. There's a really nice study by Wolf and Bromham. They looked at uh, 13 phylogenetically independent contrasts and they found that endosymbionts involved in mutualisms tend to evolve, evolve significantly faster on average than their free living relatives. So again, that suggests potentially high rates of symbiosis. Finally, um, plasticity, uh, work in evolutionary, evolutionary theory suggests that plasticity facilitates adaptation. Uh, in, in some cases directly, but also simply by buying time for evolution to occur by slowing rates of population decline. And those effects can actually be quite large. So these things don't tell us that corals can adapt to projected rates of climate change, but they do suggest that evolution can, be, can occur substantially on the kind of temporal order that we're looking at uh, over the next century. And so it suggests that it might be worth about trying to evaluate what's, what sort of effects evolution might have. The only person who's uh, done that to my knowledge is Marissa, Marissa Basket. And so in 2009, she published a paper where she uh, tried to estimate the potential effects of adaptation, temperature adaptation in endosymbionts under a couple of different scenarios. And what she found was that what she projected was that under a business as usual scenario, the red line is an, a symbiont that doesn't evolve. The blue and gray are two different scenarios involving evolution. Is that under a business as usual scenario, essentially they all go extinct before 2100. The red line right around 2030, more or less in line with, uh, with what uh, Ove's projections were. And uh, evolution d uh, allows populations to last a bit longer, but not to make it to the end of the century. Under some alternative scenarios, for example, the B1A scenario, what she found was that still the non-evolving symbiont goes extinct more or less at the same time. But in the presence of evolution, there is, in fact, potential for the population to adapt to warming temperatures. So what does this mean? Does this mean we should uh, chuck the old projections in the bin and use these projections instead? Well, the couple of reasons why we might not want to chuck the old projections in the bin. And one, of course, is that uh, the outcomes of these kinds of projections are obviously going to depend on demographic parameters. They'll depend on the, emission, the details of the emissions trajectory. And Marissa's only looked at one sort of set of, uh, of demographic parameters, only one realized only one simulated trajectory of emissions for each of those uh, scenarios. The second point is that some parameter estimates, including heritability, which is kind of important, uh, she had to estimate from other taxa. So, there, so her heritability comes from free-living phytoplankton, not from, uh, not from endosymbionts, not from zooxanthellae, because nobody had produced, well, there are no estimates of heritability of optimal temperature uh, for endosymbionts. Uh, there are lots of processes that are left out of this model, like are left out of any model. Evolution of the host and phenotypic plasticity, the potential for migration of tolerant geno heat-tolerant genotypes. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, other things that are omitted include unknown constraints or trade-offs, which we know can alter the rate and direction of evolutionary change. They can potentially reduce the capacity to cope with other stresses by reducing genetic variability along other dimensions. And they can potentially limit the success of immigrants. For example, an incoming coral uh, genotype is unable to form an effective partnership with the resident symbiont. So, uh, that, so the question is then, what do we do? So we've got, uh, we've got a model with evolution, but of course, it involves simplifying assumptions as well. And I think if we're going to try to express what we expect to see happen to coral reefs, what we should do is uh, adopt an approach that's very similar to what uh, climate scientists do. So this is a graph from the fourth IPCC 
assessment report. And it, what it shows is estimates of climate sensitivity from a whole bunch of different studies. They use a whole bunch of different data sets, make lots of different kinds of simplifying assumptions. So each line is the sort of uncertainty distribution in the estimate of climate sensitivity from a single analysis. And what they've done is they've plotted these for a whole bunch of different models, essentially. And so this gives us a picture of the, the range of likely outcomes under a set of plausible kinds of assumptions about reef futures. So um, we, we have tended in coral reef biology to spend a lot of time thinking about you know, trying to center on one projection that we all agree on. Uh, I doubt because we're all scientists we'll agree on any one single projection, but one way I think we can effectively communicate, and climate scientists have effectively communicated what the consensus was, is by uh, producing these kinds of ensembles of model predictions and using those as a basis for making recommendations to policymakers. So uh, I'll quit there.